Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Roy Smith talks about seasonal price patterns in corn and soybeans. Art Barnaby outlines potential cuts to crop insurance. Craig Derrickson explains a project to help maintain the Ogallala Aquifer. And Tina Barrett describes the current ag financial picture in Nebraska. Roy Smith is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. The 2015 corn harvest is wrapping up. U.S. farmers are 96% finished, two points ahead of the country's five-year average pace. In Nebraska, growers have picked 92% of the crop, two points behind normal. Ohio has now joined Illinois and Missouri as the only states completely done with corn harvest. The USDA is expecting big outputs this fall, including record corn and soybean production in Iowa, Nebraska, and Minnesota. We talked with Roy Thursday morning to get his views on current price movements. The only thing I can say is uh, we've, we've got a big crop and it, the crop is bigger than what the trade anticipated. Uh, the crop is bigger than what most farmers thought they were going to have. And uh, we're staying, seeing the results of that now in the, uh, I guess I'd say the slowness of the market. The market just kind of Treading water. Treading water, I guess, yeah, that's a good way to put it, that, that uh, it, it just isn't going anywhere. It tries to go for a couple days and looks pretty positive as it did the, earlier this week and then just kind of dwindles down to almost nothing. We talked maybe four or five weeks ago in mid-October and then we were talking about tracking the dead cat bounce. Since then, where have we gone? Uh, basically, the dead cat bounce has uh, gone to the bottom and stayed there. I mean, it's very frustrating. Uh, having watched this particular move for over 20 years, and I've never seen it act like this. It just, uh, it just seems like it can't get going, and, and you wonder, well, what's so different this year as to, compared to other years? And the only thing I can say is that the, the market is probably telling us that there is a huge crop out there. Now, having said that, um, I drove in some areas of southeast Nebraska earlier this week and and I don't see the big piles of corn that we have in a lot of years when the corn is the yield is good and the quality is uh, wet and but that may be a function of all these new silver grain bins that uh, we see this year that haven't been there last year or the year before that. Because of the struggle of the dead cat bounce are you resetting the target that you would pull the trigger at? Well, absolutely. I uh, re reset it in terms of uh, dates, you know, maybe not in terms of price. Uh, I, I doubt that we're going to get up to the level where we're a dollar a bushel over the, uh, over the harvest low, uh, which is what I always look for. Uh, so, you know, I think there, there's another another saying that I have a drop dead date you know at what point you just give up and walk away and take what you can get and and normally uh, December 31st on soybeans for me everybody's got their own level but for me December 31st for beans because I don't want to pay storage on the few beans that I raise uh, July 1st for corn well we're a long ways from July 1st and 
these bins that you see here close by are full of corn that's 14 percent moisture so there's no hurry plus there is no southern hemisphere crop to hold over the market so i think corn has some potential just from a seasonal standpoint soybeans uh, if we don't see it in the next six weeks um, they're, they're going to be a, a lot of giving up and taking what you can get and i don't like to market that way but that's the, the situation we're in we don't want to let the storage costs eat up the value of the beans. You said one of the keys to watching the dead cat bounce was also watching what basis did that basis also had to improve, has it? The basis absolutely hasn't improved at all. So it depends on where you're at. Certain elevators uh, or certain processors have maybe bumped the basis a little bit to try to shake some beans loose out of the country. But it's very frustrating uh, knowing what I do about the dead cat bounce and the basis that previous years before the soybean harvest was over we've seen that basis start to improve. This year it didn't do that and in fact it hasn't improved any now that all the beans are out of the field. So it, it, it really is enough to make an educated farmer scratch his head and say what's going on here. Well I don't know what's going on but Maybe we need to deal with this situation and don't uh, don't let those beans set in the bin and, and uh, eat up the value of them in storage costs. Next week, Mike Briggs will join us to look at cattle markets. This year's four-state crop insurance workshop hosted by UNL's Ag Economics Department in Grand Island last week featured a discussion that was made very timely thanks to legislation in Washington, D.C., a budget deal passed and signed in late October included a $3 billion cut to the crop insurance program by capping insurers' rates of return. Additionally, a new bill would go further by, for instance, eliminating the harvest price option. Kansas State Ag Economics Professor Art Barnaby talked with us at the event in Grand Island about how that cut would impact farmers. But we first asked Art why the crop insurance program has become a target for cuts. Clearly there's a group of people out there that want to take money out of crop insurance. They want to do other things with it. Um, it's sort of ironic. Um, crop insurance is really a very small part of the federal budget. Maybe the uh, last time my numbers I've looked at, about a net cost of roughly $5 billion a year, something like that. Uh, it's a, even a small part of the USDA budget. Uh, uh, by contrast, we spend something north of $80 billion in food stamps and other food programs, which is by far the largest part of the USDA budget. In fact, all of production agriculture probably counts for only about maybe 11, 12 percent of the USDA budget. Even though we think of it as a farm bill, we call it a farm bill, most of the dollars don't go to production agriculture. What are some elements of crop insurance that could be on the table for cuts? Well, the first one that is definitely on the table is the $3 billion cut which makes a nice headline, but nobody knows what that means. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about, is that 10 years or that three? I don't know the answer to that, but what, what is in there is a cap of 8.9% on their net retained premiums, their returns. The problem is the government misdefines mis returns. What it, it really is, is returns on gross margin. Because if you're a business person, you think, well, gee, I'd like to make an 8% return on my assets. Well, this is the returns on the difference between the premiums and the claims, and nothing more. So all the other costs have not been covered, such as agent commissions. Now, there is some additional cash that comes in in the form of A&O, but that's not sufficient to cover the cost, and hasn't been for probably 20 years now. So the bottom line is um, they do the same thing with the way they define underwriting gain, which is really gross margin, and that's the way it should be referred to. Because um, underwriting gain in the private property casualty means that is where you're at after you start with the premiums, you take out the claims, you take out the commissions paid to agents, you take out the loss adjustment expense, you take off running the insurance company, the, uh, paying the reinsurance premiums, paying their employees, all of that, you get down to a bottom line and that's an underwriting gain and that's or loss and that's totally different 
the way the government defines it, which is just the difference between premiums and claims. Is eliminating the harvest price option on the table? Um, that is in this new bill that was just introduced. Um, the other is actually in law. It's got to be taken out of the law if it does, in order for it not to happen. Uh, but this is a new bill that was just introduced. Uh, and yes, it would have a major impact uh, not only on farmers, but also the insurance providers, or at least that's what I'm going to show them this afternoon. That would cut the premiums about half in Iowa. Uh, and all policies is made in Iowa, so my apologies to Nebraska. Uh, but you, in, in the case of Iowa, your, your premiums would be cut in half. Um, and my haven't looked at Nebraska, but I bet it's pretty close to the same number. The problem is you're not going to cut the claims in half because just because the price that goes up doesn't mean you're going to entirely eliminate any crop insurance payments even under revenue insurance without that harvest price. So yeah, it will infect all farmers. What happens if you eliminate crop insurance as you know it and just leave it to the private sector? Well that's going to take a much bigger jump and, and don't send me any cards and letters on this because to get to a private sector you've got to close down USDA. You've got to eliminate the structure out there and I mean you've got to low, eliminate the county FSA offices. I don't think this is going to happen. So. But just to get the theory of a private market, you'd have to have that completely closed down because farmers would be paying at least double what they pay now for crop insurance if it was all private, uh, assuming that they would even be able to buy. I think they would be able to, probably would be offers in Nebraska, some other states, I don't know, probably not. But the point being is if that infrastructure is still out there of county offices, will farmers pay double the premium when they can expect that maybe Congress will come with an ad hoc disaster program and they got the infrastructure in place to get it out there in the form of those county offices. So to really get to a private sector market, the only place I know where it exists is Brazil, uh, where they have no expectation of any kind of government help. So you have to have everyone believing and knowing that if I don't buy coverage, I really am self-insured. I'm not gonna get any help. And then maybe they would pay, or at least a significant number would pay double the premiums. Okay, do you believe there will be significant cuts in the near future? Um, the three billion I think is a high risk. That's being absorbed by the insurance companies and that may cause um, some of them to withdraw from the market. So uh, that is, I think, still a possibility. Uh, I don't think there's the votes for these cuts on the program itself, and it's not just the harvest price, but it's a whole bunch of other cuts that would impact farmers, means testing, payment limits, a whole bunch of things that would in that legislation. Uh, I don't think the votes are there now, but what I could see happening is just take the harvest price, for example. Somebody could take a one sentence line to eliminate the harvest price and stick it in some non-related legislation and be buried in 11,000 pages like they print these bills, and no one's not gonna know it's there until it passes and then it's too late to do anything about it. And it's harder to get it out of the law than it is to get it in the law. And that's how the three billion got put in. It was put in, um, everyone agrees it came from the White House, it was put in, nobody knew it was in the legislation until after it passed. And that's the only way, at least under present circumstances, do I see that these cuts could happen. It'd have to be stuck in there by somebody buried and then you find out later it's there. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to Art's presentation from the Crop Insurance Workshop on potential cuts to the program. Multiple reports have indicated the $3 billion cut will be taken out of the budget before changes can take effect. A Kansas State University study says depletion of the High Plains Aquifer peaked in 2006 and its use will decrease nearly 50% over the next 100 years. The findings released this week show the eight states sitting above the aquifer are using water at different rates. For example, depletion in Texas peaked in 1999, Kansas in 2010, but it's not projected in Nebraska, South Dakota, or Wyoming before 2110. There are efforts to preserve one of the nation's most valuable water sources. The USDA announced last week it'll provide Nebraska $2.4 million in the 2016 fiscal year for its ongoing Ogallala Aquifer Initiative. We talked with Craig Derrickson from Nebraska's Natural Resources Conservation Service Wednesday to learn how that project is helping to manage the state's groundwater. Well, the uh, Ogallala Aquifer Initiative 
is a subset of our most popular conservation program here in Nebraska, uh, and that program is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, or EQIP as it's commonly known through across the country. And um, the Oglala Aquifer Initiative is just additional funds through that EQIP program that we've had for the last five years, and we've been using it specifically to uh, put focus on water conservation and irrigation improvements that can benefit the uh, health and condition of the aquifer. This new round of funding from the USDA for fiscal year 2016, about $2.4 million, what will that money be used for? We'll use those funds to um, work with farmers and ranchers who want to improve their uh, water conservation. Uh, for example, in the past we have helped a lot of farmers uh, convert from their surface irrigation system to a much more efficient system like a center pivot system. And more recently, there's been growing interest in subsurface drip irrigation, which is sort of the ultimate inefficiency because you have almost no water loss or evapotranspiration. And we do other conservation practices that um, help conserve um, moisture in the soil, such as no-till and residue management, and those practices are also good at uh, benefiting water quality to help control um, runoff and the nutrients that uh, go with the runoff. Are there key focus areas for this year? There are, um, and going uh, back in time just a little bit, um, the funding that we have for this has always needed to be prioritized um, targeted, if you will, to certain areas. And so for the past two years, um, our office has released um, essentially requests for proposals for uh, groups and organizations that want to put forward sort of a, an idea of how they think they can help us maximize the use of these funds to get the biggest bang for the buck, if you will. So in Nebraska for fiscal year 16, we have uh, four priority areas in Nebraska that are associated with our um, natural resource districts. You've said that Nebraska as a state is ahead of the curve in managing its groundwater from the Ogallala Aquifer. In what way? Well, I think one of the things that we need to give a lot of credit to is the natural resource districts, the NRDs that we have here in Nebraska. You know, they've been in place a little more than 40 years and um, they focus heavily on water management and water issues in Nebraska. They, um, all of the districts have uh, water management plans and um, they do a very good job of creating the focus and the attention that's necessary to improve the water resource. You know, and in a state like Nebraska, we say we're blessed because we have such highly fertile prairie soils. We have this great water resource, the Ogallala. Uh, we are positioned probably better than any state and maybe any country in the world in terms of the soil and water resources that we have. And so I'm always happy to say the, the districts as well as our state government system does a really good job of helping us protect those resources and encourage our farmers and ranchers to be good stewards, and they are. Craig says if producers are interested in getting involved with the Ogallala Aquifer Initiative, they can submit a funding application throughout the year at their local NRCS office. This month's Nebraska farmer says sunflower head moth is a key pest of sunflowers, especially in Kansas, where it can overwinter and migrate into Nebraska fields during spring. Over the past two years, a specialty crop block grant from the Nebraska Department of Agriculture has been assisting UNL in researching natural head moth resistance in confection sunflower varieties. To learn about this research from UNL and Nebraska Extension entomologist Jeff Bradshaw, you can check out the November Nebraska Farmer. In our previous episode of Market Journal, we talked about boom-bust cycles in agriculture and if the current financial environment was indicative of another bust. That conversation came from the four-state crop insurance workshop in Grand Island, where we also spoke with Nebraska Farm Business Inc.'s Tina Barrett. We talked with Tina about the current farm debt load in Nebraska and analyzing input costs. But to start, we asked what farmers can be doing now that harvest is finished or close to complete. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's always funny because after harvest, everybody says we don't have anything to do, but there's plenty to do. Certainly, um, gearing up for some tax planning is probably on most people's mind. Um, and getting some things figured out there. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different this year than it has been the last couple. So 
um, for the first time we're starting to look at needing to bring in some income instead of trying to figure out how we're going to spend some money. So um, certainly some differences there. What are the things they can be getting ready for tax season, sort of uh, rounding up all the paperwork and whatnot? Well certainly for some producers it's, it's getting the books done for the year and that they haven't done all year long. Um, and, and getting that taken care of. And so that's certainly number one priority, if, if you haven't done that, that we need a good solid set of books. Um, you know, but I think it's also important that we have a good handle on what the yields were so we can kind of get a good gauge of where the accrual income was as well, um, what we're looking at pushing into next year, um, because tax planning kind of needs to be more than just a two-month decision. What's your message to producers as they get ready for an off season where we know that margins are getting much, much tighter? You know, I think it's important that they, you know, already they're going to be already having to make decisions on 16 seed and fertilizer. And um, it's going to be really important that we take a look at those decisions and how they affect bottom line. Um, it's, it's often fun to look for ways to maximize yield, but we want to make sure that when we're, when we're upping that yield, that the cost is not more than what we're going to get out of it. You know, we certainly don't want to be spending more um, than what we're going to get back. So, you know, taking a look at how that's going to affect net income more so than gross income. Um, you know, certainly we got to always watch for marketing opportunities um, and those sorts of things. Um, and then also from the non-farm side of watching those family living costs. And that's, you know, really something that we can't just look at at the end of the year, but we really need to be working on all year long. Is there an easy rule of thumb with family living in places that you can cut or an amount that you should be shooting for, or is it a case-by-case -case basis? You know, it's a tough thing. Um, you know, and a lot of times, I mean, there's certainly things that, you know, kind of seem like a home run of cutting vacations or um, those sorts of expenses out. Um, but oftentimes they're not going to get there. And the reality is it's probably a matter of cutting um, a little bit out of every category um, and trimming things back is what's really going to make, uh, make a difference, uh, more so than just cutting those few high ticket things. And a lot of times we don't look at those things as, as an additional cost, but, you know, anytime we're eating out instead of cooking at home, you know, that we know it costs more. Um, or uh, just, you know, wearing the same clothes for a little yeah. bit longer rather than replacing them, you know, more often. So, um, th you know, those sorts of things are probably what we need to take a look at. I was curious about Nebraska farmers' debt load today because Kansas, uh, a professor from Kansas talked about the amount of debt that was increasing in Kansas. Is that consistent with Nebraska that they haven't been able to eliminate debt over the last few years? Yeah, and for a proportionate, Nebraska's numbers are pretty similar, but, but significantly larger. So average Kansas debt was about 500,000. Average debt in Nebraska was a million dollars. Um, but we certainly have seen that same increase and in doubling of debt in about the last 10 years. Why is that that they haven't been able to cut that down? You know, there's a, there's a lot of reasons. I think um, you know, we t today we talked a little bit about some of the management things of not wanting to sell some of the grain at the lower prices is going to cause some of that. Um, I think tax law has had a lot to do with it, and the fact that we measured debt December 31st. So in December we're, we've been busy prepaying, borrowing money to do that, holding the grain until January. So while we're not in trouble in a current position, current debt has been increasing dramatically. Um, and the same aspect on an intermediate standpoint with the equipment, we've been buying equipment, writing it off for taxes, putting on a five-year note, um, which has caused that intermediate debt load to increase. Um, so certainly have to watch you know, each of those categories of debt, but now we have to reduce debt with after-tax dollars uh, because we don't have a deduction for principal. So we have to keep taxable income up in order to reduce that debt down. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. During this last week we did see a rather significant storm system move across the state. We kind of hinted at the previous forecast that we would see the slope move into the central plains and drop some significant snow or potential for some significant snow, particularly in western Nebraska. Well, we did see that snowfall set up. The heaviest of the snowfall fell from essentially Otwater, Kansas, southwestward towards Sharon Springs. In that area, 15 to 20 inches of snowfall were reported. Just to the north, across the, uh, the Nebraska border, south of McCook, totals were up in the 6 to 7 inch range and broad spread around the southwestern portion of the state into po the western half of south central Nebraska. We've seen totals coming in anywhere from 2 to upwards of 5 inches of snowfall. Further east came in the form of liquid. And of course that liquid was very heavy in some locations, portions of south central Nebraska, particularly from Hebron over toward Fairbury and just to the north of that region, we've seen totals coming in the two and a half to three and a half inch range. So this was an area that has been abnormally dry now for the better part of the last three months and there was sufficient enough moisture to eliminate 
most of the deficits have occur, accumulated over the last 90 to 125 or 20 days. So we would expect to see some significant reductions in the depiction from the drought monitor in regards to Nebraska's abnormally dry regions and the moderate drought areas of southeastern Nebraska. Those will probably go to abnormally dry in next week's edition. So let's take a look and see if we have more storms on the way. And as we go to the upper air model, the system that moved through over the last 24 hours that brought light to moderate snow across northern and eastern Nebraska has now moved to the Great Lakes region. And we will probably see very cold conditions at the surface coming from the northwest. So our highs are going to be stuck in the lower 30s for the most part across the state, northeast Nebraska, maybe in the upper 20s, under partly cloudy skies. As we go into Sunday, we will start to see this low pressure system relaxing. The ridge starts to build in rather rapidly. We've been looking at highs approaching the 50 degree mark in portions of the panhandle. Further eastward, we're going to add about 5 degrees to the temperatures. And as we get into Monday, now the ridge starts center centering itself right over the center part of the country. So we're going to be looking at temperatures consistently from the 40s in northern Nebraska to approaching the mid to low 50s across southern Nebraska. I'll draw your attention to the west. We have another storm system that's going to take shape and depending on the overall track of this system will determine whether or not we get this storm coming in on Thanksgiving or it comes in the end of the weekend. This current model that I'm showing you now brings this system in on Thursday, Friday, but some of the models in the past week have been pushing this later in the weekend. So stay attention to the weather because things could change rather dramatically. Overall, we're going to have a rather significant storm system somewhere in the western United States that will impact travel significantly during the holiday weekend. So as we go into Tuesday, this system starts to get its act together. We start to see the first piece of energy shoot out. Looks like it will generate some light precipitation, particularly across southeast Nebraska. But more importantly, as we get into Wednesday, the system really wraps up, brings a lot of moisture up into our region. We could see the development of thunderstorm activity, particularly on Thursday. But the first initial moisture should start to Wednesday night, and that will carry on into Thursday across western Nebraska, and we could see some significant significant snowfall accumulations and that will gradually move through the state on Thursday, generating severe weather across southeastern Nebraska and more importantly on Friday, we keep the snow around with very cold temperatures. So let's take a look at the temperature forecast. Uh, very cold this first part of the weekend, warming up during the midweek before that storm comes in with very cold temperatures. We look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, so those cold temperatures stay in place and in terms of precipitation from next Thursday through the following Tuesday, above normal, but most of this is taken into consideration that impending storm system. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, potential cuts to crop insurance, maintaining the Ogallala Aquifer, and the farm financial picture in Nebraska. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Next week, Mike Briggs will be our cattle market analyst, and Dave Gaylor will talk about developing a positive relationship with your banker. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.